Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of The Surfer's Journey. Today's episode is the ultimate surfing lesson. And guys, if you're new to the channel, please subscribe now so you can stay up to date with all of my latest videos and tutorials. But for now, let's get into today's lesson of the week. The surfer's journey is a long one and there are so many different skills to learn and in today's video we're going to cover everything from a beginner level all the way to advanced level and everything in between. Deciding on what beach you're going to surf at is a really hard question, especially for those of us who have never surfed before. So we need to go to someone who has that knowledge and the best place to go is your local surf shop. They should have good knowledge of your local surf breaks and where's appropriate for a learner to go surfing. We want to make sure that we're surfing somewhere that's safe. We're looking for a sand bottom break, not reef, not rock. We want to make sure that the beach is pretty safe. We don't want to have rips and strong currents out there. You want to make sure that once you get to the beach that the conditions on that day are safe and appropriate for you. Alright guys, so I'm ready. I've got my board which is appropriate for the kind of skill set that I'm at, I want a big long board when we're learning. Either a long board or a foamy is going to be pretty perfect. It's buoyant, it's going to be easy to catch waves, and nice and stable once we actually get up, and really easy to paddle. So before I go out, I need to make sure I've got a few things. One is that what I'm wearing is appropriate for the conditions, and this wetsuit and my booties is going to be appropriate for this pretty cold day. I've got a leg rope attached to my board. That's going to make sure that if I fall off, my board's not going to run away and hit someone. And then lastly, I'm going to put wax on the board. This is going to give me a sticky platform to stand on and help me stay on the board once I actually get up and riding. When you're applying wax, you just want to make sure that you don't go too far over the rails. You don't need to, but go as far back or as far up front as you want. Now that that's all done, it's time to get out there, so let's go. So now I'm down at the beach, I'm about to paddle out, I've got to make sure I put my leg rope on and I'm ready to go. Now on the way out we want to make sure that the nose is facing out to sea. That means that I can lift the nose up like this and any oncoming wave will go straight underneath. Now we want to make sure that we're comfortable with our paddling position so that when we get on the board we know how to paddle and where it's comfortable for us. With your paddling position, you don't want to be too far forward or the nose will go under the water. And if you're too far back, it'll be up in the air. We want to be somewhere in between. And you want that stringer of the board to be down the middle of your chest. That way you're centered and the board won't rock from left to right. So like I said guys, we want to be waist deep. And what we're looking for that foamy white water broken wave and I've seen the wave I want so I'm going to turn around and give myself enough time to get into position and catch this wave. So I'm going to jump on in my correct paddling position and paddle. And initially just catch the wave on your belly. Get used to what it feels like to actually be pushed along by a wave. And once you're comfortable with that then later you can try and stand up. So once that you feel that the wave is pushing you along, then you want to get ready to pop up. So the hands go underneath your shoulders on the deck of the board. Lift your chest up and then jump up and you want both your feet to land on the board, about shoulder width apart and you want your feet to be in the center of the board so that that stringer is going in the middle of your feet. And then stay low and keep your arms up like this. By having your arms up like this, you have a bit more control. And by squatting low, you're going to have more control with that lower center of gravity. And as you get better, you can start to stand up and extend a bit more. Once you're comfortable catching white water waves and being able to pop up, well the next step is to get out the back and practice catching an unbroken wave like this. Once you get to this point, surfing becomes a totally different experience. You go so much faster when you're on a wave and the feeling is hard to beat. To 
catch an unbroken wave, you want to be looking and make sure you're in the right position. So I've seen the wave coming that I want and I'm going to turn and start paddling so that I give myself enough time to generate speed and momentum to actually catch that wave. And then once I feel the waves pushing me along, I want to stand up as fast as I can. And you may have noticed that I paddled in with my board on a bit of an angle. This makes it easier to make the drop. If you went straight ahead, sometimes it's easier to nosedive. Once you can stand up and ride a longer wave, the next thing you want to start trying is turning your board like this. And you can start by making small changes of direction by simply looking and pointing to where you want to go. Do this gently and you'll find that the changes happen slowly, but that's okay initially. Once you get used to that, you can start to push harder as time goes on. In this example, you can see how every time I go to turn, you can see that weight transition from my heels to my toes and so on. And that all starts by looking and pointing. If you try and make a direction change too quickly, sometimes you might find that you lose your balance a little bit. So remember, just take it slow to start off with and you'll find that you get used to that feeling of turning your board. I've got other videos about how to start turning, so I'll put the links to those in the description below. Another skill that you want to learn once you actually can get out the back is to sit on your board like this. By being in this position, I'm able to make quick changes of where I'm going. So I've spotted a wave, I'm going to quickly sit on and pivot, which is going to allow me to catch waves with limited time getting ready for it. Another benefit of sitting on your board is that you're elevated, so you have a better view of the waves that are coming, and you can position yourself accordingly. To do this, you simply just sit on the board and squeeze it tight with your legs. It'll take some practice, but it's very beneficial and worth dedicating your time to. You might also find that if you're surfing a longboard, that your feet start to go up the board like this. You might do that to get your weight forward on the board on fat, flat sections like this, just to help keep momentum. And then you can shuffle your feet back when you want to try and turn that surfboard. Remember that time in the water is key. That's the only way you're going to be able to improve these skills. But by knowing how to improve them and what to work on, you know what you need to focus on when you're actually out in the water. When a surfer reaches a level where they're happy to venture out and catch an unbroken wave, at some point they're going to have to make their way out past that waist deep whitewater area that we encourage learners to stay in. A surfer has to go past that, they have to get out the back and to do that there are various techniques that we can use. Let's have a look at what these three techniques are in greater detail. Let's quickly discuss why a surfer would bother trying to get past all those waves to get to an unbroken wave out the back. Well the waves out here have much more power and they allow surfers to perform a variety of maneuvers. Obviously if you're just surfing white water there's only so much you can do but on an unbroken wave you have a whole world of possibility open to you.
do we even need to duck dive? Well, not always. Sometimes we can just paddle over waves like this. But if we've done a detailed pre-surf analysis, then hopefully we've spotted an area that we can paddle out through that has limited waves breaking. If we can do that, we'll make our lives a lot easier. The duck dive is by far the most efficient way of getting out past the waves. As you can see, a surfer simply dives underneath the wave, the wave goes over the top of them, and they pop straight up and continue paddling. Let's have a closer look at how to perform the duck dive. Firstly, you must paddle towards that white water or the wave to generate momentum to get you under. You then straighten your arms and push the board down underneath the water. And then using your foot, you place it on the back of the board and then you push the board so it's totally submerged. And then the key part is to push the board forward once you've actually submerged it. Now, as you can see here, my hands are about to shoot forward as the surfboard goes with it. This then generates momentum to go forward and get underneath that wave. And once you get up, you then recover and continue paddling. One thing you might notice that surfers do is you see that rear foot come up in the air. Well, that's pretty much just a counterbalance as your opposite leg pushes down on the board, the other one often kicks up. This isn't something to waste too much energy on, just be aware of it. The turtle roll is a more common technique used by beginners and intermediate surfers. It doesn't take as much technique and practice and also it's easier to do with bigger high volume boards. As you can see here, the surfer simply rolls over, holding the surfboard close to the nose. As they roll over, they then keep that close to their body. So you pull the surfboard into you. Keeping it close to you and pulling it in allows the wave to roll over the top. This technique has some flaws though. It's not as efficient as a duck dive because you don't go as deep. So often what happens to surfers is they get dragged back by the wave more. Ditching or bailing your board like this is a method that should only be used in worst case scenarios. It's very dangerous if you're surfing in crowded lineups. If there are surfers behind you and you ditch your board, well chances are that board's gonna stretch as long as your leg rope is and then it's gonna hit someone behind you. So it's very dangerous. Commonly though, this technique will be used for surfers who are surfing big waves because a duck dive won't be able to get them underneath those waves. This technique is also incredibly inefficient. If we look at it compared to a duck dive, you can see the duck dive, I go underneath the wave and I'm straight back paddling again. However, when I bail, the wave drags me all the way back, especially because the wave catches your board and pulls you back. So how do we actually choose which of those three techniques are best for us? Well, a big part of it comes down to what kind of equipment you're actually using. So if you're on a big, high volume board, then the turtle roll is probably the better option for you. However, if you're on a smaller board and you're able to duck dive it, then that is definitely the way to go. It's gonna take some practice though to work this out. And sometimes you might have to nail the turtle roll when you've got a bigger board. And as you progress in your surfing and you go to more high performance boards, then you'll be able to learn the duck dive. The duck dive is the preferred method of choice and I would highly recommend that you invest time and energy into learning and refining your duck dive. Once a surfer gets out the back, a whole new world of experiences awaits you. To perform a turn on a surfboard, there are many things that happen. We're talking about upper body rotation, looking with your eyes, transitioning your weight from front to back and from heel to toe. If we can put these together in the right combination, at the right time, on the right section, then we'll be able to unlock a whole library of turns. Now obviously there's no set way to surf, but there's a few key skills that every surfer regardless of what kind of board they're surfing, needs to know. Let's have a closer look at what some of these maneuvers are.
All turns are essentially just a change of direction, however they're performed on different sections of a wave with different body movements and positioning. This will allow us to change our turns from a carve to a snap to a re-entry to a reverse, etc. To set up any maneuver, a surfer must be able to perform a bottom turn. So to perform a bottom turn, you simply go down to the bottom of the wave. You look to where you're going to perform your top turn. As you do this, your front arm is pointing to where you're going to go. You're looking and as you drive off the bottom, you start compressed and as you come out of that turn, your body extends and that weight's going onto my toes. Then I enter compression to start performing my top turn and I start to rotate my upper body and I start to look back to the foam and now the weights transition onto my heels. I keep looking and I keep rotating, therefore my board will keep turning. And to finish the maneuver, I explosively push out my back leg and put all the weight onto my front leg and I throw my arms because that helps create weightlessness in the surfboard and it allows me to finish that top turn with more explosiveness. And to finish, I simply compress low and reset. If we look at that from point of view, you can see that as I'm looking and pointing, my front arm is pointing to where I'm gonna perform that top turn. Do you see the board follows? I then look back to where I want my board to go and you'll see that the board follows once again. And you can see here the transition of weight onto my front foot as I extend my back leg. And then I can press low to finish. Let's have a look at an example of a bottom turn to top turn on the backhand. To set up the bottom turn, I go down to the bottom of the wave. Now bottom turns can be adjusted depending on the section and where you are, but let's just keep it simple for now. I can press low to start my bottom turn and as I come out, I start to extend and I'm looking and pointing to where I wanna go. Once I get to the top of the wave, I look and I change my direction. My upper body rotates with my eyes and that allows my weight to transition from my heels back onto my toes and then I can press low to finish that maneuver. Let's have a look at point of view. I get to the bottom of the wave. This is a great example of seeing whereabouts I'm positioned on the wave. If you look at my shadow, you can see the upper body rotation, which is gonna help me put my board up onto that section. I then look and point back to where I want my board to finish. And once again, you can change this depending on the section that you're actually on. Remember that where you look is where you go. As you progress with your bottom to top turn combinations, you can start to put it together on more critical sections and perform it with more speed and more power. The roundhouse cutback is an extension of what we just learned of that simple top turn. To perform it, you simply do a bottom turn and spot the section. Now a roundhouse cutback is typically more of a horizontal move that's performed on a fat section of the wave. So you look and point and then once you get to the top of the wave, you then look back towards the foam and you keep looking and keep rotating for longer this time. I wanna keep my board on rails so that I'm able to put my board onto the foam like this. Now with some practice and with some better sections, you'll eventually be able to form a more critical re-entry off that foam. But by performing roundhouse cutbacks, you'll utilize the most of a fat slow wave. Another key benefit of performing a roundhouse cutback is that it allows us to go back to the power source and this point of view will show what happens. So as I put my board up onto the foam, I then get an acceleration of speed from that foam, which sets me up nicely for the next section. A re-entry is when a surfer puts their surfboard up above the lip of a wave. Let's have a look at how to do this. You simply perform another bottom turn as you usually would, but we want more rotation now. Notice how I've rotated more. My front arm has thrown up high and where I'm pointing is where my board will eventually end up. Once my board's up, I quickly rotate back down and I look down. This has to be performed with speed and aggression because it needs to be fast.
let's have a look at an example of a re-entry on my forehand. Now, once again, I'm setting up by doing a bottom turn and I'm looking and pointing and holding that weight onto my toes because I wanna keep driving up. Once I put my board up, I look and I rotate the opposite direction. In this case, I've decided to push out my back leg, which has allowed me to release the fins. This isn't something to focus on right now, but as long as you remember that once your board's up above the lip, you need to quickly and aggressively look and rotate down to the bottom of the wave. Once we can perform re-entries, we can then add them in to the roundhouse cutback like I mentioned before. By simply holding your rail longer and performing a re-entry high off the foam, you're gonna maximize more speed as you come out of that maneuver. And it's gonna set you up for the next section that's coming. So what is flow and why is it something to aim for? Well, flow is aiming to perform maneuvers back to back with as little downtime as possible. Now, sometimes a wave won't actually allow you to go top to bottom, top to bottom. But if we can do our best to keep the board on rail, and that's where we can utilize roundhouse cutbacks. When it is fat, by cutting back to the foam, we set ourselves up for our next section. And we buy ourselves a little bit of time for that wave to actually grow and develop. With time, practice, and lots of repetition of practicing your bottom turns, your top turns, your cutbacks, and your re-entries, you'll get confident to then put these into different combinations on a wave. And as your confidence builds, you'll start performing these maneuvers in more critical sections. And ultimately, if you can do that successfully, it's gonna look better and feel better. Progressing from a beginner level surfer to an intermediate level surfer can take some time and we need as many hours in the water as we can to practice. But obviously we need certain sections to practice certain maneuvers and sometimes that's out of our control. But by knowing exactly what we need to do when we're presented with a certain section, we're gonna be prepared for when that time comes. Another skill that intermediate surfers need to learn is how to surf a wave top to bottom. Now in this example, we can see that this wave would allow for this opportunity because it's steep and bowly. So I wanna stay in the pocket by going top to bottom, staying close to the power source. By doing this, my turns are more critical, they feel better and they look better. Let's have a look at another example. Here you can see I take off and I go down to the bottom of the wave to perform my bottom turn. I then drive up to the lip and I wanna perform my maneuvers high on the wave, as close to the top of the wave as possible. By doing this, I'll maximize my spray and speed and the turn will look better. By keeping that board on rail for longer by looking back to the power source which then puts me back into the pocket and this allows me to set up for my next maneuver. For this section you can see that the wave was throwing out it's more vertical so it allows me to put my board up to perform a re-entry with a little bit of a float. If you're ever presented with a section it's better to hit that section than go around that section if you can. Now as I came out of that you can see the wave had really fattened out and this is where the roundhouse cutback plays a crucial role. I'm able to cut back to the foam, perform that re-entry or foam climb on that foamy section, which is then gonna give me more speed to come out and perform another maneuver. Coming out of that roundhouse, you can see the wave still didn't have much to offer. So I did another roundhouse cutback. This has given the wave time to form another section. And you can see the section that's coming now was steeper. And this section was gonna allow me to perform a carve and it was steep enough to let me throw the tail at the end. Remember that weight transition onto our front leg will help loosen the tail. Intermediate surfers maximize any turning opportunity. And even on a small foamy section like this, you're able to still do a little foam climb and release the tail by practicing that weight transition from your heels to your back leg as you explode and then onto the front leg you're going to learn to eventually slide the tail but that's something to work on down the track surfing is all about having fun with your friends 
in any kind of conditions. But most surfers don't like surfing small waves. But if we can figure out what equipment to use and how to surf small waves better, then we can have more fun and surf more often. It's a win-win. It's a reality for many surfers that more often than not, the waves are small, grovelly and fat. So it makes sense that we should spend time learning how to surf those kind of conditions as best as we can. Every opportunity to practice is an opportunity that you have to improve your surfing. But also you want to have fun in those conditions. You don't want to see those days and think, nah, I'm not going out. That's a wasted opportunity. So to make the most of those smaller days, there are a few key skills that a surfer needs to have to make the most of those conditions. Let's have a closer look at what some of those skills are. Wave selection is hard to teach, but by using point of view, you guys can see exactly what I see and I look for. It makes it easier to understand. So what I'm looking for is a steep section of the wave which I can see right here. And if I look to my right, I can see that it's flatter. So I know that the wave's gonna break towards the right. And I wanna take off on that steep section. By doing that, it allows me to perform multiple maneuvers before the wave closes out. And I'm looking at the lip to see what the lip's doing. I also can see by looking down the line if that wave's gonna break. And I can adjust my speed accordingly. If we have a look at this example here, you can see the waves doing the opposite. It's steep to my right and flat to my left, so I know that it's going to break to the left. So I take off and go in that direction. But in this case, as I look down the line, it's about to close out. So I perform a manoeuvre on that closeout section. As you can see here, this is a closeout. I look to the left and the right and it's steep the whole way across so I know it's going to shut down. It's not going to allow for multiple maneuvers, but sometimes that's as good as it's going to get. And we can still practice maneuvers on closeout sections like this. Good wave selection means that you're able to say no to waves much like this and paddle to better waves like this. By knowing what to look for, it's gonna help you catch the best wave of the day. Whether that's a wave that allows for multiple maneuvers or a wave that only allows for one turn, you've gotta make the most of the conditions on that day. And don't think that closeout sections only limit you to re-entries or floaters. They can also allow you to practice calves like this. You just have to practice your timing and mix it up. By practicing and refining our single maneuvers on a closeout, we can then link them together on those bigger, better days. So now that we understand what waves we're looking for and the waves that we want to catch, now we need to know where to take off on those waves. And that's where we talk about peak positioning. As you can see here, that was my friend taking off on a wave that had already broken. And because he wasn't on the initial peak, it meant that he took off on the shoulder. Well, this section here is the peak of the wave because it's that initial breaking section. And just to the right of that is what we call the shoulder. Ideally, surfers want to take off on a peak, much like my friend here, because that allows you to take off with maximum speed. And it means that you're going to take off close to the pocket. In this example here, you can see someone who's up and riding and you see that wave spilling in front of him. Well, that's a section. And when we're presented with a section, we can turn much like this and performing a maneuver on a steeper section means that that maneuver is more critical and it often looks a lot better.
Here you can see I'm looking to see where the steepest part of this wave is because that's where I want to take off. That's the peak of the wave. By taking off on the peak, I'm already close to the pocket and I've got maximum speed and power and my maneuvers are gonna look better, feel better and be more critical. So we understand what waves to catch and we know where we need to take off on those waves. Now let's discuss what kind of maneuvers you can perform on different sections. Here you can see a flatter section. So I'm gonna do a roundhouse cut back, back to the foam. But I wanna get over these sections, so instead of going around, I'm gonna try and float them or do little foam climbs to get around those sections and hopefully get past them. It's better to do that because you maintain your speed better than if you just went around. In this example here, we see that I catch a much better wave, a really good left-hander. Where possible, a surfer is aiming to link their maneuvers together as smoothly as they can with as little downtime as they can. I wanna stay close to the pocket because that gives me maximum power, speed, and better sections. So when it's a flatter section, I carve back to the foam. And when the lip throws out, I put my board up onto that lip, it's called a re-entry. And when it's a bit of downtime, I try and generate speed for the next section. There are no set rules with surfing and you can perform whatever maneuver you want on whatever section you want. I would recommend trying different things on different sections. And once you get confident, you can start trying new maneuvers or you can start performing your old maneuvers on bigger, more critical sections. And practicing this in small waves is a good way to do it. It's a good way to build up your confidence because we know that the consequences if we fall are quite minimal. Your choice of equipment plays a massive part in how much success you have when you surf small waves. If you're on a really high performance surfboard or a really low volume board, you may find that you struggle a lot in smaller conditions. You might struggle to even catch a wave, you might struggle to catch speed, or you might find that when you stand up, the board feels like it's sinking. So what kind of surfboard should you be riding on those smaller days? There are so many different surfboards available and you could surf whatever you wanted on any given day. But from my experience, the boards that go best in small waves are boards like this. Here you can see my mate has a mid-length and you can see my other friend has a high volume fish. I like to surf high volume fishes when it's really small and grovelly because I find that they generate speed better, they're better paddlers and ultimately I have more fun on these boards when the waves are small, slow and grovelly. If you have the choice though, I would try as many different boards as possible to see what works best for you. Intermediate surfers can perform maneuvers and they can perform them pretty well. Carves, cutbacks, re-entries, floaters, etc. They've got them down pat, but to go to the next level, we need to put them together because doing them on their own isn't enough. Now the first thing that you can consider is your surfboard choice. Now chances are you might be on a mid-length or maybe a higher volume fish if you've followed some of my advice. Well now I would recommend looking at going the opposite way. So now we wanna go a little bit longer, a little bit thinner and a little bit more rocket out. By getting that, we're gonna have more performance and more responsiveness from our board. And that's gonna help us perform more critical turns with more speed in bigger sections. And that's what we're looking for. 
So let's have a closer look at what kind of surfboard you might consider going to. Of course, you can still surf at an advanced level on a high performance fish. But something like this might make things a little bit easier for us. This is a step down, like a high performance small wave board. These can be a good way to bridge the gap between high performance fish working our way up to a high performance short board. These boards are longer again. So for example, my fish is a 5.2, but my high performance short board is a 5.8. Now I find that this is a great in-betweener for those days when the waves just aren't quite big enough or powerful enough to warrant my high performance short board. When we look at the high performance short board, we're talking about complete performance. So you have to be on top of your game because these boards are really responsive and really reactive, and they respond very well to being pushed hard in the steep, big set with speed. Like I said at the start of the video, you can probably perform multiple maneuvers, but chances are you can do that on sections which are a little bit smaller, a little bit flatter, a little bit safer. But to progress to an advanced level, you now need to perform those maneuvers that you've got on bigger, more critical sections. They're going to look better, but there's a lot more risk involved. Let's have a closer look at how you can do this. If we have a look at this example, you can see me performing a carve and a cutback on a pretty fat section of this wave. It didn't really offer much more than that. But if we look at the same cutback performed on a steeper, more critical section, you can see it looked heaps better and it also feels a lot better. Let's have a look at what it looks like from point of view. Now as we're surfing along a wave, as we bottom turn and we drive up to the lip, what we're looking for is timing our turns so that we can perform our maneuvers in the steepest section that we can. So we want to stay really close to the pocket and we want to stay high on the lip. By staying high, we're going to throw more spray and we're going to maximize that wave's power. Now following on from performing your maneuvers on more critical sections, now you need to know that you need to surf with more commitment. And ultimately by performing those moves on those critical sections, you'll be achieving that. But you wanna take your surfing to the next level. And to do that, you have to go outside of your comfort zone, surfing with more speed, trying to slide the tail in sections that you usually wouldn't. That's how you're gonna surf with more commitment and that's how your surfing is gonna look much more advanced. To surf with more commitment, we need to keep our board on rail for longer. Instead of doing a turn like this, which is a bit short and snappy, we want to keep that board on rail and keep carving through a turn. If we look at that snap again, it's not on rail for long and it's a shorter snap and it's not as committed. However, if we look at this turn, you can see I kept leaning and I kept rotating and I just held my rail for longer. It throws more spray and it looks a lot better. If we look at point of view, you can see what I see. So as I drive up to perform my maneuvers, I'm looking back. And the further you look back when you're doing a carve or even a re-entry, the more rotation you're gonna get. And then at the end of those maneuvers, it's gonna be easier to slide the tail. Now one thing which separates an intermediate level surfer from an advanced level surfer is the speed at which they react when they're performing their maneuvers and the speed at which they carry through their maneuvers and through the duration of a wave. Now higher level surfers will surf with a higher level of speed across all those different categories. Let's have a look at how you can do the same thing. This example of point of view is a great example to show how fast you need to rotate and turn your body. So I'm gonna look to where I wanna do my maneuver and then I'm gonna quickly look back to the bottom of the wave. By doing this, my maneuvers are gonna be faster and more critical. In this example, you see me bottom turning straight into that top turn and then maintaining my speed going all the way down and keeping that board on rail for as long as I can and performing my maneuver as high and as vertical as I can and rotating quickly. I'm maintaining flow and going from one move to the other without delay. So what does make the cake even mean? I mean, clearly this isn't a cooking show. What I'm saying is that 
by following all those first steps that we've already discussed and putting them all together, essentially they're ingredients that we're gonna to mix together and make the cake, now you're gonna have everything that you need to surf like an advanced level surfer. Let's have a look at all those key points and how they tie together. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking to perform our maneuvers high and tight on the wave. And we want to make sure that we choose the appropriate maneuver that's going to maximize the speed and power of the wave. And if we can slide the tail at the end of our calves, it makes it a little bit more progressive. And by exploding out our back foot on a re-entry, we're going to release the fins and that re-entry is going to look better and feel a lot faster. On my backhand, you see the same thing, staying close to the pocket and performing a variety of maneuvers with speed and power in the critical section of the wave. Guys, thanks for watching the video today. I hope now you understand where to start surfing and how you can progress and fast track your progress as you go. Remember to like the video and comment below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see. Thanks guys, catch in the water. Mm -hmm.